the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. So part of my ritual on Sunday mornings, at least for now, for the next couple months, I'll have to have a new ritual. It may be sleeping on Sunday mornings at, at 4 o'clock in the morning at least. Uh, but my ritual now is at 4 in the morning, I get up and I, I uh, start really trying to put together exactly what I'm going to say. And then at some point, I check the news uh, brief just for a, a break, but also if there's something that's going on in the world that, that we need to have voice, uh, that give voice to, I, I, I check for that reason too. And I checked this morning as I was preparing, and something grabbed me and didn't let go. Uh, it sort of haunted me in some ways. Uh, it was a story about a, uh, a man now who, who lost his life yesterday, um, but he started losing his life about a month more than, less than a month more than 20 years ago. He was 17 at the time, and now he's, uh, or close to my age, uh, a little younger. Um, but he was in his school library in April, deciding what they were do, uh, what they were going to do that uh, afternoon after school with his friends, whether they were going to go fishing or whether they were going to go play golf. Uh, and they're sitting around the library when they hear the sounds of uh, gunshots. And then a teacher runs in and tells them all to get under the table. And they do, and the gunman comes into the library in Columbine, Colorado, and systematically starts shooting the students under each table. Uh, and this young man uh, watches his best friend die and is shot through the, the hand uh, and through the knee. And within 45 minutes of this, as he's taken to the hospital, he is on painkillers. He said he liked the feeling of it. It numbed what he wasn't ready to face. It dulled the senses that needed dulling, and he kept on dulling the senses for years and years after and became addicted to opioids. At different moments in his life, he uh, was on various stages of recovery, uh, always an addict, uh, of, of course, um, but there were moments where he was able to help others uh, and tell his story, others who were suffering from addiction, and while there's no... Uh, particular reason for his death, the assumption uh, that's been given yet, the assumption is that it was his addictions uh, that cost him his life. Uh, and it struck me, uh, not that it was the first person that's been in that kind of situation uh, that has died too prematurely, or uh, that it is by far the only uh, person that's, uh, that's lost their life to opioid addiction. That's it much closer to home here in this community uh, and amongst people we care about. Uh, but there was something in uh, that story that just seemed uh, to, to suggest in a profound way that uh, those forces that we're going to renounce in a few short minutes, those forces that rebel against God, those forces that destroy and corrupt the creatures of God, could claim victory. Something that snuffed out hope for a bit filled the room as I read the details of that story of that young man who died too soon, who had been dying in part for such a long, long time. I went to a conference last week, and I talked about it last week. It was uh, a really a fantastic conference, and the speaker, uh, who had been teaching homiletics for 40-plus years, talks about uh, the funeral service and how do we preach at funerals, and he said, you know, you are guaranteed at every funeral to hear at least one sermon. And he said, that will be the sermon that death preaches. Not little d, uh, the death that all of us uh, will eventually succumb to, the death that sometimes can be a grace. Uh, the physical death of, uh, of our body no longer pumping blood or, or taking in and releasing oxygen, uh, but the big death, the death that claims to have dominion, the death that claims to win the battle. So that death will claim victory at every funeral if we do nothing more than memorialize the person uh, that died, that our responsibility as a preacher 
is to preach life and resurrection, the truth that we celebrated five weeks ago, the, the truth that still should be reverberating through these walls and beyond these walls, that Christ is alive, that hope is on fire, and that we carry that into the world. So there desperately needs to be two sermons preached at every funeral. And surely the second one needs to be louder. How do we do that? I think these readings today give us a good roadmap. First, that reading from Revelation. And if we know anything about those apocalyptic uh, verses that we have in our sacred text, it is about living in chaos. It is about the chaos that already exists in our world. It's about times of famine and war. Uh, it is times uh, when the forces of evil and wickedness seem to be winning, and that is when that literature uh, is composed. And that literature suggests, it doesn't just suggest, it proclaims that the story never ends there. That no matter how wild, turbulent, chaotic, hopeless it may seem, that God is at the helm. That the God who will wipe away every tear, who will destroy and stomp out death forever, is at the helm. And that we stand on that boat knowing it may wave back and forth and it may rock, but it will never, ever sink. That God is at the helm. And then we have the reading from the gospel. Jesus, after he has washed the disciples' feet, after he told them, I know that one of you will betray me, I know one of you will deny me, he washes their feet. And the very fact that Jesus is there in the flesh is uh, about the expansiveness of God's love. That God uh, went from the divine to fully take on our human condition, our human nature, to live just like one of us. That God's love had no brackets. That God came in the flesh, lived in the flesh, gave all he had, humbled himself to wash his disciples' feet, knew he was about uh, that night to be arrested and the next day hung on a cross and humiliated, says to them a commandment that's been there longer than time. Love one another. They already knew that. That's been there, the uh, commandment since the beginning of time. He said, love one another. But then he put in a bracket buster. <coughs> love one another as I have loved you. And the cascade of images of that sacrificial love, that love that washed their feet, uh, that love that hangs on a cross and says, Father, please forgive these people who are humiliating me, who are hanging me there, who are torturing me. Forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. That love proves itself to be the most powerful force in the universe, especially when the light grows dim and it seems like those other forces are winning. And the epistle reminds us what that kind of expansive love looks like. Uh, Peter is uh, met several times, twice uh, with the dream, but three times uh, the dream repeats itself in the previous chapter uh, of, um, of Acts of the Apostles. Uh, and Peter is there, and he has this vision uh, on top of a roof of this sheet. And on this sheet, all of these animals that are part of God's creation come down, all of these animals that uh, the purity laws say... Uh, uh, are unclean, that are unfit for, for him to eat. And three times this voice of God uh, calls to him and says, Peter, eat it. And he says, no, I've never uh, let unclean food touch, touch my, my, my mouth. Uh, and he says, eat it. And then finally he says, anything that God has created, you cannot call unclean. And this isn't about what you eat or about uh, the, the ritual food consumption. It is about how we love. We've kept putting brackets around. Of course I can love. I'm really good at loving my family, especially when they do everything I ask them to do. I'm really good at loving my friends, especially the funny and enjoyable ones uh, who call when I'm down and always seem to lift me up. I'm really good at loving my tribe who look like me, who think like me, uh, who agree with me. I'm really good at that. That's not what Jesus says says, love one another the way that I have loved you. Love outside your tribe. Love outside your political party. Love outside your religious beliefs. Love outside uh, to the people that do you wrong, that are uncomfortable, that make you uncomfortable. Love expansively the way that I have loved you. That's what 
Peter was being awoken to. And that's what we're being awoken to. Love one another the way that I have loved you. So what we do today is an act of rebellion. It's an act of defiance against what you see outside of this world, against the headlines that you'll read. Uh, it says, what you do today says that you believe the most powerful force in the universe is God's love. That you come forward and you receive a love that is more powerful than any amount of hopelessness, than any amount of destruction, than anything the world can do to, uh, do to each other. Uh, you come and you put your hands forward and you say, put love into my hands so that I may be equipped to love the way that you love me. And I can go forth and do that. We're going to baptize. That's an absolute act of defiance. We are committing to not just telling these two wonderful children, but living and making sure they trust that that spirit of adoption, that love uh, that is poured upon them this day is always there and has the power to transform the world. That we mean it when we make our baptismal promise to seek and serve Christ in all people, in all creation. To love our neighbor and not define our neighbor narrowly the way that we love ourselves. To respect the dignity and wholeness and godliness of every human being. What we do here is an act of defiance. And as I go out uh, of these doors and as uh, we begin our summer vacation, don't forget the importance of coming here to be fed by that promise. That God's love is put in your hand so that you have a power, more powerful than anything outside those doors. And so that you can be that hope and that love that the world needs. That doesn't give defeat, death, evil the last word. But the love of God that we proclaimed on Easter Day that still resonates uh, and vibrates through these rooms <coughs> is the core identity the core strength that we propel out into the world. Amen.